we are ready to begin our second talk. Now, you may not know this, but at Astronomy on Tap, our speakers don't get paid. They do get paid in beer. This is the first time that we will not be able to pay our speaker with beer. Our speaker today is Dr. Meredith Rawls, who is forming a protostar at the moment. And therefore is incapable of receiving proper cleaning. And so please join me in giving the warmest possible welcome to the thoroughly undercompensated Dr. Meredith Rawls. So my name is Meredith. I'm a postdoc at the University of Washington, and I also study stars. You're getting a whole bunch of star stuff tonight because stars are the best. Yeah. I agree. Uh, I also write software, so you know if you like software, you know that, that's cool too. So stars and software together. That's kind of my life story right now. So this, as you probably may have guessed, I think it stopped playing the movie, but this is the sun. Have you guys seen that before? <laughs> like maybe every day this month? <laughs> so this is actually a, a picture of the sun from, from earlier today, taken from a satellite up in space. And you can see all the different activity and cool stuff going on in the sun. And uh, what you might not know is there's also a lot of interesting activity going on inside the sun. And, oh, it's going to play the movie again. Well, that's cool. We can watch the movie again. So this is kind of the outer surface of the sun rotating. It's, it's sped up a little bit. It doesn't actually rotate that fast, but, you know, it would be really boring if I stood here and watched it rotate in real time. <laughs> but inside the sun, there's also a whole bunch of activity happening. So this is uh, not an actual crop x-ray of the sun. I can't, I can't look inside the sun with my eyes. I wish I could, because it would make my life really easy. But our sun actually rings like a bell. It has these oscillations that go inside it, and that's what this picture is showing you. So not only do we have these cool solar flares and uh, coronal loops and lots of activity going on on the outside of, this, of our sun, we also have a lot of activity going on inside the sun. And what's really cool about this, this ringing, these oscillations, is that you can use them to study how our sun is made from the inside out, which is pretty awesome. So lots of things resonate and ring, right? I said the sun rings like a bell. Well, it turns out other stars do too. So the sun's great, but it's like right there, and that's boring. So I like other stars better. But they're farther away, and so that makes it harder to like see what they're doing up close. But because they also resonate, we can we can study them with this cool star quake reson resonation bell ringing thing. And so this is showing you that our sun has some characteristic ringing frequency, like a you know medium-sized bell, if you will. And then bigger stars have different characteristic frequencies. They might sound like a lower, bigger bell, like one of those clock tower bells. But, but it's, it's such a low, such a low set of frequencies that uh, even if you could hear it, which you can't because space is a vacuum, darn, uh, you wouldn't be able to hear it uh, with your ears because it's too low frequency. But, uh, but, and this graph goes all the way up to a viola because I play viola and violas are awesome. <laughs> and they also have resonance frequencies. So, you know, you can just go home and tell people you learned that stars are like violas if you want to. Because that's not entirely wrong. Alright, so star quakes are awesome, and I hope that I can convince you of not only their awesomeness, but also their utility. And, and I want to kind of take a step back and remind you, like, star lifetimes, right? So we learned a little bit about how stars form all the different elements in, like, everything, right? Like beer and everything. Uh, and that happens, you know, you know, the two categories of things, beer and everything. And that happens in, for massive stars in particular. So on the right-hand side here, we have kind of a massive star life cycle. It forms into this big old blue thing, 
and doesn't live all that long, and it blows up and makes all those heavy elements, and it's really amazing. But for every one of those stars, there's like a bajillion lower mass stars, kind of like our sun. It's a technical term. There's a lot. And they have a much longer lifetime, and they don't end their life quite as excitingly. But it's but they live they live a long time, and they're important because they're like our sun. And, and even though I know I guessed our sun earlier, and I apologize because the sun is actually really important. And you know, planets orbit the sun, and other stars also have planets. And you know, there's cool stuff out there with some like stars. So the main difference in these two life cycle options is mass. And so the mass of a star is really linked to its fate. And so what we'd really like to be able to do is measure the mass of stars. Right? Because if you look up at the sky at night, you can't just say, oh, I know how much that star weighs. I know how much that star weighs, right? Like, it's not something you can just tell. If it was, then I could just go home and we'd all be done now. Um, so, yeah, it's a little difficult. So one way we can do it, and this is a way that I actually like a lot, is uh, using, when you have two stars, you can measure how massive a star is and learn maybe it'll blow up in a supernova or maybe it'll be more like our sun and become a white dwarf at the end of its life. So the way you do that is you look at when the stars pass in front of each other, you measure how much light gets blocked, and then you also measure the Doppler shift of the star as it like moves around each other, and you combine that, and you can actually get a very reliable measure for how massive the star is. It's really pretty sweet. So I like this method a lot because it's pretty straightforward. Um, I know how to do it. It's always helpful. <laughs> you know, I have some software that does this, right? Like, if every star was this way mass measurable, that would be really great. Um, and, and it's also really good because we understand gravity, right? This is just using gravity. Something goes around something else, and we can use that to figure out how massive it is, which is, which is great, and it's a well-known technique. Unfortunately, not all stars are binaries, so it's not going to work for every star ever, and we're only going to be able to figure out the fate of stars that have binary dance partners. And while those are the best stars, in my opinion, there are a lot of other stars, too, and we'd like to be able to measure their mass also. Oh, it's also really slow to do this thing on the right. It takes, like, a lot of telescope time, and it turns out that other people also want to use the telescopes for, like, galaxies and stuff? I don't know what that's about. <laughs> you have to come back another month and hear about that. Okay, so uh, this is all leading up to me telling you that I have a cool way to measure star masses using those ringing oscillations, those star quakes. But how does that work, right? That, that's not a straightforward thing to say. Like, we have a bell that's actually a star, and I'm telling you that it's actually a, a way to kind of weigh the star. Uh, so, sure, fine. Uh-huh, totally, right? Oh, yeah, and yeah. I'm assuming. It's the, it's the, the oscillation of the bell. All right, so how does this work? Well, here's another picture of kind of the, the inside of the star, if you can see it having all these different oscillations. And so the trick is that even though these, these ringing bell oscillations are happening inside the star, they make the star's brightness change a little bit. We can observe that with telescopes. Yeah, telescopes. And and so this is like a brightness changing over time thing. And because we like math, we can pull out the frequencies at which that happens using a Fourier transform. Who's scary? And and maybe maybe you get a nice graph with locations showing you all the different frequencies. And then you can say, hey, I can characterize how that star is oscillating. You know, does it have a lot of low frequencies? Because it's really big, does it have a lot of high frequencies? Because it's small, does it have a really weird combination of frequencies? I have no idea what's going on. All of these are options. <laughs> but you can you can use this to kind of learn a little bit about the star's properties. So this is what it really looks like. It you know I show you the pretty picture and, and that's great, but this is more what you have to do in real life. 
you fit a bunch of curves to a bunch of wiggles and you try to convince yourself you're not making it up. Uh, it's fine. It's fine. Trust me. It's fine. It's fine. So, so, so what I like to pretend that graph looks like is this, because this is much nicer to look at, right? This is much, this is much more friendly. And and so, so maybe you can convince yourself. Like, if you look in the middle of this, there's like more stuff there in the gray. And if you just like zoom in on that and flatten out a bit and stretch it and poke it, then it looks like this. And and you can measure. You can measure the middle of that, and you can measure the spacing of those, and that actually tells you something about the star, which is cool, because all I had to do was measure the star's brightness a whole bunch, turn it into this, and then I could directly measure uh, something about the star's surface gravity. So that's like, you know, you go to the moon, you can jump really high. Well, if you were all these different stars, you'd bounce, never mind, but you could have different uh, surface gravities depending on the star its temperature, and also its density, how fluffy it is, or if it's like super packed down on the white dwarf. So that's fun. And as you might guess, stars like our sun are hotter, more dense, and have a higher surface gravity, and stars that are bigger and oscillate with lower frequencies are cooler, less dense, and have lower surface gravity. So okay, that's a lot of physics words. That's great. Big stars. Cool. Uh, literally, big stars. Cool. Yeah? Alright. <laughs> so, the reason that we like to study these big red giant stars that are, you know, it's like what our sun will be when it runs out of hydrogen. Uh, it's not going to happen anytime soon. You don't have to worry about it. But eventually, our sun will become a red giant like this, and uh, it is going to be a lot brighter so we can see it with a telescope, which is helpful if you have a limited amount of time on a telescope. And it also oscillates a little more slowly, so maybe you don't have to like observe it every second, because that is difficult. So we like, we like to study the big ones. So because we want to study the big ones, we're like, well, could we just pretend that a big evolved star that our sun will eventually be is just a, a big version of our sun right now. Because if we're trying to measure the mass, if we know our sun's mass, and we can figure out the surface gravity, and the temperature, and the density, and do some math, like if you, if you stare at math, you can to yourself that if you have the gravity and density, you can get a mass, which is pretty sweet. Uh, then, then couldn't we figure out the mass of this star. Like, that seems, that seems doable. So what, what we've been doing, or, or what, what some of my colleagues and I have been doing, is using Kepler, everybody's favorite exoplanet telescope. Woo! Yeah, yeah Kepler! Not just good for planets, also good for stars. You, uh, you measure the brightness changes, you make these cool graphs that totally look like this, and now I've got other one. And then you do some math to turn your densities and your gravities into masses, and also radii, but we care about mass right now. And you can actually get the mass of the bigger star. So, so that's pretty sweet. And what's nice about Kepler is that maybe you guys know this because you're all experts on exoplanets, and though we talk about them a lot here, uh, it stared at a lot of stars. It stared at them for like four years, and it's still looking at other ones. And so it is ranking up a whole bunch of these bright, big stars. And, uh, and we can actually get masses for a whole bunch of big stars really quickly, which is awesome because the other technique that I was telling you about with the binary stars, not only do they have to come in pairs, but it takes forever. And doing it this way is a lot faster. So that is pretty sweet. But before I let you go, I, I, I want to, we want to be good scientists here, right? How do we know the masses are right? I mean, this, I've maybe convinced you that this could work, but it'd be nice if we could, like, verify that the numbers that we're getting aren't completely wrong. So, okay, how are we going to do that? We can compare with binary star masses. So I made a little graph, and it looked like this, and I put 
the mass of some stars using star quakes, and these stars happen to also be in binaries. And I put the mass of the stars measured with binaries on the other axis, and then I was like, oh crap, it's not one to one. I broke science. Oh no. In fact, uh, it, was, it was off by about 16% on average, which, you know, was kind of bad if you want to measure masses. And, and we were like, okay, okay, this is fine. This is science, this is cool, it's all right. What, what's going on here? And, uh, and it turns out that what's going on here, like, <laughs> turns out that, that what's going on here is that big red giant stars are not quite so simply just giant versions of our sun. I mean, they, they are, but they also kind of aren't. They have their own weird convection stuff going on. There's different stuff happening in different layers of the star that isn't quite the same as what happens inside our sun. And it's just complicated enough that you can't just compare them one to one, even though it would be super handy if you could. So what we have to do is we have to apply empirical corrections in order to get accurate masses. Um, we have to fudge it a little bit, but it's consistent. So, uh, so it's fine. It's fine. Totally works. Not a problem. Don't worry about it. But what, what, I, what I do want to leave you with is that this technique actually works really great for stars that are like our sun. For these, for these, you know, smaller stars, it's just a little harder to observe them enough to see the star quakes because they oscillate more quickly. So, eh, trade-offs. Um, so, so you now, believe it or not, have learned a little bit about asteroseismology, which is your word of the week, uh, aka star quakes. Um, and it's actually really useful, even though sometimes it doesn't work perfectly, because you can measure a lot of stars' masses really fast. So thank you very much. We have plenty of time for questions, so do your worst. Oh boy. Did you microphone recording or I just pointed? Okay. Yes. Uh, why is 16% good enough? <laughs> why is 16% wrong good enough? Well, it's it's not. It's just that it's it's correctable. So it was we were we weren't necessarily assuming it was going to be a perfect one-to-one -one when we did this and uh, and the fact that it was off by a certain amount was actually really interesting you know I it because it means there's some physics we don't really understand perfectly yet so it's you know there's more work to be done but it, it's still a really a really useful technique so that's got a question over here yeah What's that? Yeah. 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 Sure, that's a great question. So the question was that I, I said that we use brightness variations to measure the oscillations, but don't other things also cause the star to change brightness, like exoplanets or other stuff? And then just absolutely yes. And in fact, the, the fact that we were using binary stars, right, there's eclipses in those that look a lot like exoplanets, so we had to kind of cut that out and use the chunks of the the chunks of the light curve, the brightness changing, that was not part of the eclipse in order to in order to do this. So yeah, it's a little tricky. Lots of things make stars stars change brightness, but the characteristic frequencies here are in a special spot in the frequency range that makes it not too tricky. But it's something we have to consider. Yeah. What else we got? Over here. Did you create no, the question was, did I make up this entire methodology? I wish I had. I have like, well, maybe not a Nobel Prize, but <laughs> no, I just use it to, I, I use it and then I tear it apart a little bit and then I use it some more. <laughs> this is an important part of science. 
it's a very important part of science. Did I see a hand over in the middle somewhere here? Yeah. Uh, so do I use uh, just visual astronomy or also radio astronomy is the question. Uh, I only am working with visible light. So it's it's possible to do... Well, I don't actually know if you can do the radio or not. I don't think you really could because you, you need the time resolution. You need to have that observation like super regularly. And I think radio is not really set up to see a set of frequencies. So. Other than the consistent 16%, what was the most exciting surprise during this whole thing? What was the most exciting surprise during this process, aside from the 16% offset? Oh man, that's a good question. I think it was really cool just that we found this many stars to even test it on. Because we were like, okay, so there's, there's got to be binaries that are also oscillating. Like, there's got to be. Like, we're going to try to find them. Like, they have to be there. And then we found, like, enough to actually make a graph and make a good conclusion. So that was, that was really good. Yeah. <laughs> Alright, what goes our star away? Well, the sun weighs one solar mass. Uh, <laughs> a standard as anything. We tend to measure stars in terms of how many times our sun they weigh, just because it's fast and easy to talk about. But most of the stars in our study, if you look really close to the axis, it's really faint here. This goes from like 0.8 to like 2.2 solar masses. So they're, they're similar mass to our sun, but some are twice as heavy and some are a little less. What is the units of what now? Oh, so it's the mass of the star measured using star points compared to the mass of the star measured using the binary star thing. Yes. Ah, what physics is causing the star quakes? What a fun question. So it is, these star quakes are driven by convection. So it's, uh, it's a continually, uh, stochastically driven process that's happening in the outer layers of these stars because there's a lot of turbulent convection going on. And so any star that has a convective outer layer, potentially will have a constellation. Good question. So the question is, do I have any idea why the, the star quake mass, when I measure the mass with star quakes, it comes out higher instead of like sometimes higher and sometimes lower? And, and the answer is kind of complicated. Uh, but but uh, the, main, the main thing is that the fact that it is like systematically high or systematically low, right, tells us that there's something in the physics that we're missing. Right, if it was like just scattered everywhere, then it'd be like, why are we so imprecise? Like, why do we suck at measuring mass? Like, at least this way we know that we're we're doing it right both ways, and they're just not giving us the same number. That's that's my main takeaway. And if you really want to dig into some of those papers, you can you can Google around. It gets dirty quick. <laughs> Does the, uh, frequency of the star change with the age? Does, it, uh, does the frequency of the star change with the age? Oh, does, okay, do the frequencies of the stars change as they age? That's a really great question. Uh, so it, it doesn't change... So, okay, so yes, it does change as the star ages and gets bigger, then the frequencies change, but it won't change like over the course of a year or two. Right, so the star time scales are like really long. And as, so like a star like the little yellow sun will become a big star like the red giant and then over the course of that evolution the frequencies totally change. Yep. How do you define like the surface of a star? How do you define the surface of a star? How do you define the surface of a star? <laughs> it's actually not an easy question. Uh, stars have lots of layers, and sometimes it gets kind of dicey out there near the edge where maybe there's some stuff coming out or 
little bit of plasma business still going on as you get farther away. I don't worry about the edges of stars because they're just dots in the sky. They're far away, it's fine. What are we going to do with the masses of all these stars? We are going to know a lot more about stars. <laughs> no, that, that's a very fair question. Why do we care about measuring star masses? It's actually really important in order to understand um, how our galaxy has evolved over time. Because a lot of different astronomy that you want to do assumes that you know the mass of the stars that are going into the picture. So if you want to understand how our galaxy formed, if you want to understand like its future or other galaxies and how bright they are and how many stars they have and what they're going to do in the future, you really kind of need to understand how much mass of the stars that you're seeing. It's a pretty fundamental thing that we don't have as good a handle on this as we would like. Good question. Alright. So, for which factor in my model has the biggest effect on changing the result? Well, it's, I, I tried to keep equations off of my slides. So I didn't think you wanted the living post. Um, there's no one thing that dominates it really, it's a combination of the, of the surface gravity, the density, and the temperature. Um, they have different powers, one's like the negative three halves, one's to the one fourth, and whatever. But it's, it's really, you can't just ignore any one of them, they're all, they're all important players. Oh man, no pressure here. By the time I retire, what do I want to have accomplished? Oh. <laughs> well, thankfully I've got a little while. <laughs> oh man, I don't know. I, I mean, I, I think that, that we're going to have more and more missions that are going to be able to take this kind of measurement. You know, hope that there's a cool satellite coming up soon called TESS that, uh, that uh, Europe is going to launch pretty soon and it's going to help us measure more stars like this. So honestly, I, I, mean, I don't know if I personally am going to be able to do this, but I think it would be really cool if we could, if we could just have a handle on the properties of all the stars in our galaxy. Like a much better handle on their specific like, details so that we can really get an accurate model of everything that's happening and how it's all moving. Are there other methods that we're using to kind of check our, check our results and see if the, the data is lined or not? The short answer is not really because there's not a lot of ways to measure masses. There is another way to measure the size of a star, its radius, though, and that's a technique called interferometry. And that works for the closest stars, where you can actually measure an angular size of the sky. I know I say all stars are dots, well, okay, if you're really careful, maybe they have a size in the sky. Um, and, and what I didn't tell you is that when you measure mass like this, you also get radius out. And those actually don't light up perfectly either. So, it'd be having another way to see if our radii are agreeing is, is really helpful. And we found, we found a, a little bit of discrepancy in radius as well, but the, the um, interferometry is, is great. So. All right, it looks like we have exhausted the audience's question asking ability about the star quakes. Thank you guys so much.